got a message uh, today um, from the Lord, where the Lord was just speaking to me in my prayer time and just kind of sharing with me. I was asking God questions, and, and God began to speak. And um, just wanted to uh, uh, share this message with you. I think it will be very beneficial. Uh, we are living in the last hour. It's the last day. I'm going to still be in the Olivet Discourse, but uh, th it's just it's the last hour. And uh, in the last hour, God is separating uh, the saved from the unsaved. Um, and that is what's happening. And there are a lot of people that think they're saved because they've been in church. They think they're saved because they've been around church. They may read the Bible every now and then. They feel something when they go to church, all of these different things. But the true test of salvation is behavior, and it's the decisions that you make. And a lot of people are doubting their salvation when it comes to uh, times of crisis and pandemics and different things. And the reason they're doubting is because they haven't had a true born-again experience. And this is what God was just really sharing with me. I was just asking God about certain ones and certain ones' behaviors and different things, and God began to just share with me that people aren't saved. So people can't do end time spiritual warfare without the spirit. And so in the end times, the spiritual warfare that is so great right now, greater than we've ever seen, of course, closer, as cl the closer we get to the end, the worse it's going to be. This level of warfare, people are dropping like flies out of the body of Christ or they're just giving in because they can't handle it because they aren't spiritual. The princes of power of the air, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness, and high places, you can't combat that without the spirit because all of that is spiritual. And so if you just in church because of your head and what you think and you trying to figure things out with your mind and with your thinking and your thoughts and all these different things, you're going to lose in this last day. It's going to require the spirit, and no man is saved without the spirit. And so this is the issue we're having. And the reason being is because people believe that they can be angry or resentful toward God and he still saved them. <laughs> That's the name of this message. Am I mad at God? You can't be resentful and upset with the Father God and expect to be saved in the end. If you're resentful toward him, you're going to be resentful toward his truth, and your behavior is going to reflect it. And if you're not behaving like him, and you're behaving like the enemy, just like Jesus told the Pharisees, y'all are acting like y'all's father, who is the devil. So let's go straight to the scriptures here. Uh, you can pull this up, adamandbeliever.com forward slash madatgod.pdf. And we're going to go to the Olivet Discourse once again, where we've been um, during this whole pandemic, basically, uh, Matthew 24 and 10. And they shall be, and, and then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. Now, this is not talking about the world. This is talking about the so-called believers. And I say so-called because can a person be saved? If they're offended and betraying and hating one another, what are we talking about? And many false prophets shall rise and deceive many. And this isn't necessarily the folks selling the, the, the miracle sand and the, the, the miracle ant farm and, you know, all the different things on, <laughs> on TV. And necessarily, that's what we think of when we think of false prophets. No, a false prophet could be someone just gathering a false audience. <laughs> this could be just someone manipulating offenses in people's hearts and gathering a false audience, pulling people to themselves, drawing people by the hurt and hatred that's in their hearts. That's, that's, that's a false prophet. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall what? Wax cold. And I told y'all the Internet is the best place to see that where people don't care at all about anybody or they don't care how what they do is going to affect someone. It's just a cold place. And that's a cold place to be in when you're no longer considering your brother and think God is on your side. And he said, how do you love me and you don't love your own brother? But he that shall endure unto the end, the same 
shall be saved. So he that, those that are going to make it until the end, those are the ones that are going to be saved. So you can walk around and say you saved all you want, but let's see if you make it to the end. Man, I preached. I, I'm, I'm done. But let me keep going. I got a little more to say. <laughs> Amen. All right. So let's get into this. When the church leadership or a member of the church hurts you, the wound can be devastating. So if you've experienced hurt, you've experienced any kind of hurt from church, a church or church leadership, church hurt is what they call it. You grew up in a house with a, pa a father, a pastor or whatever, and you were hurt and or just whatever the case, you were hurt by someone in church, that's a devastating wound, especially when your expectation is that that person is going to treat you better than a regular person that's not saved would. You know, just being hurt by a Christian, period, can be devastating uh, because you just expect more from a believer, right? It can cause an offense to build in you that causes you to demand justice and lose all of your mercy. So you can be hurt so bad that you begin to demand justice for your own pain or justice for what you've been through. And when you demand justice, you automatically lose mercy. Right? You can't, have, you can't call for justice and mercy at the same time. Because of the responsibility of leadership when it comes to churches and Ministers different things. When they error, it illuminates a pre-existing offense in you and causes you to demand justice against them while still seeking mercy for yourself. That means you go and pray to God, Lord, forgive me of my sins and have mercy on me. I'm just a sinner. And Lord, I've just, you know, I did wrong today. Forgive me. But then your brother that may have wronged you, you want justice for them. You prayed for mercy. That's a person that's a little spiritually schizophrenic. It is because <laughs> you want mercy, but don't want to give mercy. People don't know the Bible because the Bible talks about all of this. Luke 6 and 36. Be ye therefore merciful as your father also is what? Judge not, and ye shall not be judged. Condemn not, and ye shall not be condemned. Forgive, and ye shall be what? Forgive it. Just written as plain as day. Why are people having such a hard time with this? Because they're not saved. These are things that saved people do. I'm preaching in this house right now, and this is what God told me. I asked him, I was like, Lord, why, why is this hard for Christians? Like, Christians are really struggling with forgiving. They're struggling with condemning people. They're struggling with showing mercy. Why are they struggling? Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, who said they were Christians? Christians do this. There has to be a way for us to know whether someone is a Christian or not. Saved people act like this. Unsaved people can't do this. Most people are not really church hurt. It's much deeper than that. Most of the time, their offense is really an offense against God. I was praying this morning. I said, Lord, you know, I was just talking. To, I was like, Lord, what is going on? Like these folks, it just seemed like folks are just angry and mad and just wanting blood. Just, 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 just I mean, coming at me like wolves and just, it's just hatred. I said, what is going on? And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, they're not mad at you. They're not mad at you. He said, they're mad at me. Their offense is really against God. People usually do not know when they have an offense against God. They just feel they are attacking a leader or a church. The only way to get back at God for an offense you have against him is to forsake mercy and forgiveness and embrace justice and judgment against his church leadership. It's the only way to get back at God. You can't get back at God. What you going to do? Just like this guy, just go outside. Ooh! No, no. The way you get back at God is to attack his church leadership. 
But the crazy thing is the same judgment you pass on others is the same that will be passed on you. Romans 2 and 3. Do ye suppose, O man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Meaning you're judging someone who sinned and you sinned too? Do you really believe you're going to escape the judgment of God? Because we all have sinned. Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? The only reason he ain't done nothing to you is to try to lead you to repentance. But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. You're storing up wrath against yourself by harboring wrath against your brother and not forgiving. We can definitely correct people's public actions with the word of God. I've been doing that for 20 something years. Take the word of God. If you do it in public, if it's a public offense, I mean, I mean a, a public issue and you proud of it and you put it out there and all of that, then yeah, we can definitely take that and say, no, no, we need to straighten this up with the word of God. That's my job, and that's what I've been doing. That's what I'm doing right now. However, private matters, according to the word of God, should be handled privately by those that are involved. That's scripture. The person that keeps on committing that offense against the person should be excommunicated from a fellowship until they repent, and then they can be restored, right? There's not a time where you, you, you overdid it and you can never be restored. The Bible says you got to forgive your brother 70 times 7. They asked him, how many times do I have to keep forgiving? Basically, Jesus said, and he used a hyperbole, 70 times 7. That was just a hyperbole to say as many times as you need to because you're going to need the same mercy. But only saved people understand this. You got to be saved to understand forgiveness. But when a person's offense is toward God, repentance and change is not good enough. It never satisfies the anger and wrath they are feeling. <laughs> That's how you know it's against God and not man because you go to him and say, hey, please forgive me. I offended you. I hurt you. All right? Or well, I did something. And yeah, this, we good? Yeah, we're good. Yeah, yeah, man. Okay. A few months later, you all right, man? No, man. See, uh, you know. So you was thinking about it again? It came up in your mind again. That's because your offense was never with me. Your offense is against God. And I can't satisfy you. My apology won't satisfy you. You know, we have a policy even here at the church. You know, we clear everything before anyone leaves the church or, you know, if they talk to us, you know, they leave in good standing. We don't have knockout, drag outs and fights and arguments and stuff like that at this church. We don't do that. We make sure the people that I've talked to that have left this church, I, I sit them down. We've talked. I say, hey, you know. A, B, C, D, E, and we're crying and help and getting them help, and we and they agree, and yeah, you know, uh, uh, I've been in there with my elders or my wife or whatever, and they agree with us, and this is the best thing I need to do, this I need to do, this, and everything's good, you you good, we're going to check on you, we're going to make sure you're good, whatever, whatever. And then, look up online, see, he, 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 because their offense was never with me. Does that make sense? When a person's offense is toward God, repentance and change is not good enough. You can never satisfy that person. And it never satisfies the anger and wrath they are feeling. We all need forgiveness for sins. Any of y'all need forgiveness for sin? So when an offended person demands justice, they are posturing themselves as if they do not need the mercy they are depriving others Posturing yourself as if you don't even need the mercy because you're able to demand justice. Can I keep going? 
Matthew 18 and 15. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault. How? Between thee and him alone. That's Bible. I'm talking to the saved folks. If he shall hear thee, thou hast what? Gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the Facebook. No, tell it unto the social media. No, you tell it to the church. How many of you know the internet is not the church? But if he neglect to hear the church, not the internet, the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican, meaning you just excommunicate until or if he wants restoration and then you forgive him like the same Bible says to save people. Amen? Amen. This is why we do not judge people's private sins because they could have gotten forgiveness and at that point, it becomes a personal attack. If God doesn't remember, why are you remembering? So we don't go into folk's sea. You don't go fishing in the sea of forgetfulness. Amen? Because that hook going to come right around and get the back of your neck and you're going to catch yourself. <laughs> So at that point, that's why, that's why anything that is done, you know, publicly, people publicly doing things or whatever, they can be straightened out with the word of God. And even then you do it in the right spirit. You ain't trying to destroy them or, or you know, get, you know, uh, banish them, but you're just trying to straighten it out. So hopefully they'll repent for it. Um, but when it comes to private things or personal things, you got to be very careful because you don't know if they've talked to God or not. Amen. All that is required of church leadership is repentance as with us all. So you may, they may be the greatest usher in the history of usherdom. And if they sin, fall into sin or whatever, and if they repent, if they sin against you or something and they repent, you forgive them just like you would forgive anyone else. Just because they have a huge badge and a giant bag of peppermints, don't make, don't make a difference <laughs> in their forgiveness. It's the same forgiveness. All church leadership, same thing. Whether it's the pastor, whether it's the musician, well, whoever it is, repentance is all that is required. Amen? Now, when I say repentance, I don't mean saying I'm sorry. And I don't mean just an apology. Repentance is actually turning from it. Even though many... Take time to sit down for a season and gather themselves. It's not a bi biblical mandate. And we practice that here at the church. You know, folks sit down for a while. You know, they need to get themselves together for a season, whatever. You know, some, sometimes they decide to do that so I can hear the word, so I can get the word, where I can get this or that. But that's not a biblical mandate. That's not in the Bible. That's just what we decide to do or we may feel is proper, but it's not in the Bible. God never sat a leader down for sinning or took their call away because they fell into sin. Never happened in the Bible. Look at somebody. Uh-oh, now wait, now wait a minute. No, it never happened. If God took people's call away because they fell in sin, nobody would have a call. Because everyone sinned. Well, there are levels of sin. Boy, you better get out of here with them levels. <laughs> Amen. You know, the people have levels of sin because of what happened to them. So if it was a sin that happened to me, it's worse than the others. But no, no, no. God, no. God doesn't take the call away because of sin or we would all be in trouble. Yes, we would. In the book of Revelation, Jesus judged all seven churches and no pastors were dismissed. And no churches were closed, even though in our human eyes we feel that some of them should have ended immediately. They were in bad shape, some of them. And God did not sit the pastors down. He told them to what? Repent. Can I keep preaching in here? This is too simple for somebody. Romans 11 and 29. For the gifts and callings of God are what? 
are what? That means he don't change his mind and he doesn't take them away. How can we judge more severely than the head of the church? Jesus. How are you passing more severe judgment than Jesus? He's the head of the church. There must be an offense present. I promise you, if you could look into the past of people that are demanding blood from a leader's era, some leader in their past got off scot-free in their eyes, and they need someone to pay for what God allowed to happen. Mm. Their offense is not against man at all, but against God because they were hurt and he did not destroy the person or take their ministry away because of it. I'm preaching in here. They subconsciously get back at God by destroying his earthly leaders. They will even demonize and forfeit all that they have learned, the spiritual growth, and the blessings they receive from being under that leader because of an offense they cannot part with. They are the very ones, listen, and this is what God showed me this morning, they are the very ones that will fight to shut down the church in the end time. It will not be the world. It will be those that cannot forgive church offenses. They will align themselves with those that they do not even agree with just to get justice. They will align with heretics, false God doctrines, and sinners if it gets them the revenge they are seeking. How do I know this? Because this is what happened to Jesus Christ. Jesus was killed by his own people because they were offended by God. They even assimilated themselves with sinners and pagans to have Christ killed. They felt that God should not have allowed a meek and lowly man to come as the Messiah because it made their pompous appearances and grandi grandiose posture look suspect. Jesus made them look bad. This caused them to take out their anger and resentment against God on God's son. Today, people are upset at God because they don't have what they were promised by many church leaders that taught in error. And this is folks teaching you, you're going to have this and, you know, the blessings of the Lord are financial. And unless you have financial breakthroughs, you're not living right or you're not serving the, the God I'm serving because he's a God of increase. He will financially increase you and he will bless you with your miracle and your season and your harvest. And, and when this stuff didn't work for folks. They develop a resentment toward God like something is wrong. God ain't blessing me like he's blessing everyone else. I'm not getting what God had. I don't have God's best. Brother, you need an education. You'll get a better job, I promise. So because some preachers taught in error, and you know, around the 90s with the, uh, with, with the um, prosperity doctrine, a lot of preachers fell into it not even knowing what they were falling into. And I'm not, you know, making excuses or whatever because, you know, some of it should have definitely been checked by the word. But a lot of times, you know, spiritual leadership, when they're under certain ones that are doing it, they just adopt it. And they don't really research it. They just, you know, believe it. And it's easy to flip the word and make the word work for what you want it to work for. And so a lot of people did that. And, you know, they, they weren't uh, malicious with it or really trying to hurt people. They really believed it. And so a lot of people got caught up in that and got in error. They may have even been hurt in some way by a leader's decisions or a leader's behavior. Whatever the case, it must be forgiven. Look at somebody say, it must be forgiven. It must be forgiven in order for you to go to heaven. If you do not forgive, you will not be forgiven. You will not be saved if you do not forgive. Scripture tells us, Matthew 18 and 32. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt, because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors, till he should pay all that was due him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts 
forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. Now, there's something in here that you better make sure you see. This is Jesus talking. He says, so likewise, my heavenly father, do also unto you, if ye, what? From your hearts, forgive not. This means if you carry that offense in your heart, you're unforgivable. You're unforgivable. And that's the problem we have now. People have these offenses and they can't be saved. They're not saved. These offenses call them to, to use their mind and use philosophy and use all kinds of different, you know, ideologies. And it's not the spirit. They can't operate in the spirit of the Lord because of the offenses. Because their offense is against Almighty God. How do I know if I am mad at God? I put this in here so you can put yourself through a little test. I got 10 points. And if any one of these registered with you, you have a problem with God. And if you have a problem with God, if you're angry with God, you're not saved. I know somebody, you can't judge me. I don't have to. You're behaving like your father, the devil. He's the accuser of the brethren that accuses us of our sins before God day and night, according to Revelations. So if that's what you're doing, you're not saved. A saved person behaves differently. A saved person is not angry at God. A saved person loves God. Receives God's rebuke. Changes their ways. Repents of their sin forgives their brothers and sisters. Don't have pleasure. Don't find pleasure in their brother and sister falling. Don't find pleasure in their brother and sister being torn down. Don't entertain a bunch of foolishness and want to hear how bad somebody is. That's not salvation. So, 10 ways you can know if you're mad at God. First one, can you forgive and let it go? That's the first sign. Can you forgive and let it go? If you cannot, then yes, you have an offense toward God. You have an offense toward him. He is the one that forgives all, and you don't want to be like him. You know, a son will do that with his father. He resents his father and his father's behavior or just whatever his father did or whatever. If he resents his father, you know, that's what a lot of times leads to bisexuality and homosexuality because he don't want the image of his father. Or his father would be upstanding, or not upstanding, but dressed a certain way. He would dress the polar opposite. He wants to look opposite. He wants to act opposite. He wants to talk opposite. He don't want to be nothing like his father because he resents his father. <laughs> well, if you have an issue with God, you resent God, and you don't want to be like him. That's why you can't forgive and let it go because that's what he does. That's what Jesus did, and you don't want to do it. You're like your father, the devil. Number two, repentance is not enough. You don't want a person to get off scot-free. That's the first sign. That's scot-free, man. You just, I mean, you, you think you could just say sorry and, and look at my life and this and that. And this. Okay, okay, well, yeah, repentance is not enough then. <laughs> you need them to pay. Well, then you are definitely upset with God because his process is too easy. So you're mad because God's process is too easy and it lets folks off the hook. I need some punishment. I need some weeping and wailing and gnashing of the teeth <laughs> until you do something. Oh, God, this is the last time. If you save it, it's time. Oh, I promise, Lord. Oh, is that the law out there? Oh, Lord, the law is here. You are definitely upset with God because his process, you think his process is too easy. I tell men and women that all the time in their homes, in your homes, I'm going to say it right here. In your homes, don't make the process of forgiveness too difficult for your spouse. When they do something that offended you or hurt you, whatever the case, forgive them and forgive them quickly. Because I promise you on the freckles on my face. No, I'm just playing. But I promise you, God is going to flip it and make sure every point that you forced her or him to grovel, every, every ounce that you uh, 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 wouldn't allow, every, every 
second or minute that you would not allow forgiveness and allow them back, it's going to come back worse. God's going to make sure. So you, 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 you give unconditional forgiveness. Amen? But you need them to pay. And Oh, this process of God is just too easy. I need to add some stuff to it. Yeah, yeah, you mad at God. You join yourself to others. This is a sign, of course. You join yourself to others that, offend, that are offended so you can have more justification. I need to find the offended crew and become a card-carrying member of that group just for more justification. This is what the Jewish leaders did against Jesus. They united themselves with a pagan mob. Pagan mob against every law in the Torah, every law of Moses. They went against every law just to get Jesus crucified. They went against a pagan mob to ensure Christ's death. That's a sign that, yeah, you're angry at God. Your prayers go absolutely nowhere. This is, the, this is one of the best signs. Your prayers go nowhere. You get down to pray, and it's like you just, you shouldn't have said anything. You don't feel nothing. God ain't doing God ain't thinking about you. Your mind wanders when you read the Bible. You read a chapter and your mind just gone. You got to go back and read it. Well, let me, what what I just read? You cannot even focus when you talk to God. Five, your sins are minimized and you magnify the sins of the offender. You see what they did as worse than anything you could do or have done. Yes, you are mad at God because he did not avenge you. Six, you wish harm, death, and destruction and peril on people. That's how you know you're angry. you wishing death and destruction on people. You search for psalms that speak of destruction. <laughs> In your devotional, break his neck and let his teeth be shattered. Let the lion cheweth on his hip and let the, the badger and the bear, the honey badger and the wolverine scratch his chest. You reading all the Psalms of peril because <laughs> you wishing that on people. <laughs> you believe they should be destroyed for making you feel bad. But the real issue is that God didn't stop them. That's the real issue. So you're offended. Seven, your life is on hold and you can't progress. You are literally at a standstill and you cannot move forward without justice. You can't get married. Folks stay single behind offenses. God showed me that this morning. They can't get married because these offenses are so great in their heart. There's no place for love. There's no place for a companion to love. That's why it's all lust, pornographic, all of that. That's all they can, that's all they have room for. They don't have room for true love because the offense of hate is so great in them. You can't get married or you are married and your family is secondary to your offense. <laughs> These are sure signs that you are angry toward God about your life. Eight, you believe the church age is over and we don't need the church. <laughs> That's where they just, they just go there. We don't need the church. We are the church. You believe you can fellowship one-on-one -on -one and don't need a pastor. But God never said that. He never said the church age would one day be over. In fact, Christ said that he would build a church that the gates of hell will not prevail against. And after he was resurrected, then the organized New Testament church was formed. So what Bible are you reading from? You know, I learned, I've been learning. Folks hear stuff on the internet and watch YouTube and different things, and they believe it when somebody says it. <laughs> I mean, it's got to be true. It's on the internet. They wouldn't let them put it on there if it wasn't true. And they don't read the Bible. You know you're not saved if you don't read the Bible. Like, how do you know?
know you're saved? And how do you even know if your behavior is lining up with salvation? And I'm not saying everybody's going to be perfect. People are going to make mistakes. People are going to fall into sin, all these different things. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying that your life, if you are truly saved, you ought to want to live a life that is pleasing unto God. And that starts by learning what his word says and having a relationship with him. And that's not it. People love to end there. What his word says and have a relationship with him. No, no, you got to add how you treat other people too. Because God is judging that more than any of this. Because if you can't forgive your brother, he's not going to forgive you. If you can't treat your brother right, you're not treating him right. No! You feel that Christian leaders who have fallen into sin should lose their right to lead. This is, this is, this is, this is the biggest one. It's how you know you're mad at God. Yet you fall into sin all the time as a Christian. But when you do it, look at that website you shouldn't look at. You know, get a little drunk off that MD. What the Bible said, you know, take a little wine. For the MD ain't wine. MD is gasoline. You could run your car with that. Bible calls that strong drink, and it is a sin. Yet when you fall into sin, you lied here, you backbite somebody, talk about somebody, dog out somebody, you know, treat somebody bad. All these, these are sins. Malicious acts toward another, though those are sins. Envy, jealousy, those are sins. So when you fall into envy and jealousy, or, the, or these other sins, you fall in those all the time as a Christian. But when you do it, you feel it doesn't hurt anyone else. When the preacher does it, it hurts so many people. It's impossible for you to sin without hurting somebody else. That's why he summed the whole law up by saying, love your neighbor as, your, as thyself. Because if you love thy neighbor as thyself, you won't sin against them. Now, this is the crazy part. On one hand, you don't want to believe a church leader should be above anyone else. And we're all equal. But on the other hand, a church leader should be penalized more for sinning because we are not equal. What? Wait. This means that you do not like the fact that gifts and callings are without repentance. So you don't like God's setup. You have a problem with God. Ten! The tenth way you know you have a problem with God and you're angry toward God, this message is bugging the heck out of you. And you are fidgeting and getting very uncomfortable hearing it. You're itching and scratching. You may have turned it off already or you're desiring to. You would rather join a rumor mill to fill yourself with gossip and slander so that you can prove that a man's error can forfeit his ability to lead. His ability to lead, teach, and hear from God all because you don't want to be responsible for what he has taught you? This is a sure sign that you are mad at God. Mark 11 and 25, and when ye stand praying, do what? Forgive. If ye have aught against, how many? Any. That your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. Father God, we just thank you for this word, Lord. Thank you for the power of your word. Thank you, Lord, for the power of forgiveness, reconciliation. Father God, that we won't be carrying sin or the bait of Satan or anything from Satan in our hearts when you return. God, if we are behaving like Satan and not like saints, we will not see you. God, we are not in you if you are not in us. Father God, we can't even claim the label of being set apart and sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost 
if our behavior does not reflect it. We're not reflecting the fruits of your spirit. You said you will know them by your fruit, by their fruit. Their love, the joy, the peace, the long suffering, gentleness, the goodness, the faith, the meekness and temperance. If that isn't our behavior, our fruit is suspect. Are we really saved? Father, we just repent right now. If any of these behaviors have been a part of us, if we've strayed away in any way, we ask you to forgive us. And I pray for those that are watching this, that had embraced that hatred, that hurt, embraced that offense. Father God, I pray that you will loose it from them, that they will see that they are on their way to hell if they don't let it go, that they would give their lives to you, their hearts to you fully, not trust in their ability, not trust in their minds, not trust in their strength, but Father God, trust in your spirit because this is spiritual warfare that cannot be fought in the flesh. So I pray right now that you will feel with your Holy Ghost, save, deliver, and set free so we will be ready when you return and we can live pleasing unto you, offense-free, Forgive us, Lord, for holding you in contempt. Forgive us, Lord, for holding our brother or our sister in contempt. Forgive us for holding our husband, our wife in contempt. Forgive us for our, uh, our father and our mother being in contempt. Forgive us, Father God, for expecting more from others than we ourselves have given you. Forgive us, Lord, and help us to live better before you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.